Hello and welcome to the 741 channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at this Atomstack A5M40 laser engraver. In this video I'm going to do an overview of the machine and then I'm going to do a demo show you guys how it works. The next thing I want to mention is that there's an affiliate link in the description below in case you're interested in learning more or purchasing one of these machines after you've watched the video. Now if you're interested in purchasing one of these machines a discount may be available depending on when you watch this video. So make sure you check the link in the description below to see if the discount is available. Another thing I want to mention before I get started is that this video is not intended to take the place of the product documentation. If you end up purchasing one of these, make sure that you follow all of the recommendations and instructions that come with it and are available on the product website. So here's a look at the machine. Now it comes packaged unassembled, so it'll have to be put together, but that only takes maybe 30 to 45 minutes or so. I made a video detailing the assembly, so if you want to see that, check the link in the description below. Anyway, the frame is made of 100% black anodized aluminum, and then at three corners there are plates to serve as legs to hold the frame up off the table. And on the back, the power supply and control unit doubles as a support leg. The gantry moves along the frame through a belt drive system that's integrated into the frame rails. There's a motor on the side of the gantry that controls the y-axis movement, and one up here on top of the gantry that controls the x-axis. The height of the laser is controlled by loosening this thumb screw and sliding it up and down on this bracket. So this particular model is marketed as 40 watts, but 40 watts is the amount of power that the laser consumes to run. The laser itself is actually a 5 watt laser. And what that means is it's capable of engraving and cutting wood and paper, materials like that, it's not really capable of engraving into bare metal unless there's a coating on the metal like paint or anodize. The machine connects up to your computer using a standard USB cable and comes with a power supply with a switch on it so it can be turned on and off. So take a look at overall dimensions of the machine. From the back of the power supply box to the front of the frame we are looking at about 23 and 7 8 inches. So from end to end the frame measures about 20 and a half inches. So it's a little bit hard to get accurately, but the width of the gantry, including the motor over here, is roughly 22 and a half inches. From the surface of the table to the highest point on the gantry where the wires come out of the connector, we're looking at just a little bit under 11 inches. From the surface of the table to the height of the frame is about 3 inches. The distance between the x-axis stops is about 18 and 5 eighths inches. And the distance between the y-axis stops is about 18 and a quarter inches. Now the actual maximum cutting area will be a little bit less than those dimensions that I just gave because you have to factor in the distance from the stop to the center of the laser beam which is here. This bracket is adjustable but the way that I have it set now the laser can rest on the table or it can adjust to a height about three inches above the surface. So the extent of the laser travel can be adjusted by removing this bracket and sliding it up or down on these three positioning holes that are in it. Now one thing to keep in mind about this machine is it doesn't have limit switches at the extents of travel. So when using it, it can potentially butt up against its stops and then the belts can slip on the motors. And I haven't found that to be a problem as long as I keep it in mind while I'm using the machine. This machine is a protective shield in front of the laser to help protect your eyes but they also include a set of laser safety goggles. Now I found that even with the protective shield in place there is still a little bit of light that comes out from underneath the laser especially if you're sitting a little bit lower than the machine. So just to be safe I think it's a good idea to wear the safety glasses that come with the machine just in case. So I haven't had any issues so far but it's always a good idea to also keep a fire extinguisher nearby just in case things get out of hand. So for the purposes of this video I'm going to be using laser gerbil, or maybe it's pronounced laser gerbil. But this machine can also work with Lightwave and probably a few other softwares that are available. My goal for this video is to show you how the machine works and operates, and not so much be a tutorial for laser gerbil or any other software for that matter. Anyway, let's get started with trying this thing out. So the first thing I'm going to demonstrate is cutting just a plain piece of scrap paper. Now Adam Stack supplied a protective plate with this, so I've got this down on the table and my paper is on top of that. Now since this is a fixed focus laser, the next thing I need to do is set the height of it. And for proper operation, it needs to be two millimeters above the surface of whatever it is we're etching or cutting. So what I'm gonna do is grab this acrylic plate that was supplied with the kit, 
and put it on top of the paper and under the laser. Then what I'll do is loosen the thumb screw and drop this straight down until it comes in contact with the acrylic plate. Once it's just touching the plate, I'll tighten up the thumb screw to lock it in place. And now I can remove the plate and we're ready to go. Now I'm going to click this button to connect laser gerbil to the atom stack. Next, I'm going to click the frame button and watch the laser move around the image extents to make sure that I'm over the paper correctly. Looks like I'm off the paper a little bit, so I'll slide everything up a little bit and then check it again. So now I'll put my safety glasses on and then push the green play button up here to start the machine cutting. It looks like the machine worked, but that was a little light. So I'm going to take another pass, but set the power up a little bit. So now I'm just going to reload my last file. I'm going to keep all of these defaults. And then I'll raise the power up to 25% by putting 250 in the Xmax field. So nothing moved. I shouldn't have to reframe it. I'm just going to rerun this. And as you can see this time, it cut through the paper. Looks like I could have boosted the power just a little bit to get through the paper just a little bit more, but you get the idea. Next up, I've loaded up a JPEG version of a pencil drawing that my wife did of my father. And we're going to see what that looks like on some cardstock. For the settings, I'm going to stick with 1000 millimeters per minute. I'm going to go with 300 or 30% for the power. And I'm going to set the size of the image to 50 millimeters high just so that this doesn't take forever to complete. Okay, so we'll fire up the atom stack and see what it looks like. So there it is. It doesn't look like it came out too bad. Although, I think the power might have been a little high. <laughs> if I put this light behind it, you can kind of see through it a little bit. So maybe next time if I use cardstock, I'll dial the power back a notch or two. So next I'm gonna try some of this vinyl sticker material. And I think this stuff is usually intended for Cricut machines, but I'm gonna try it here and see what I can do with it. Now chances are, this is going to make some toxic smoke, so I'm going to have to be careful since I don't have my ventilation system set up yet. As you can see, that seemed to have worked. It cut the circle out and it cut the numbers out from inside the circle. <laughs> the only thing I didn't think of is this particular image didn't have a line to hold the center of the four in, so I lost the center of my four. But I think you kind of get the idea. The other thing I noticed about this is even just with this small amount of cutting, it produced quite a bit of toxic smoke here in the room. So I'm not going to cut any vinyl again until I get a ventilation system for the machine. So next, I wanted to try engraving some basswood. I ended up grabbing a JPEG of another one of my wife's pieces of artwork. And as you'll see in a minute with the final results, Everything turned out okay, but this probably wasn't the best choice for my first sample. But nevertheless, I loaded it up into laser gerbil and did some engraving on a thin piece of basswood that I have. So after the image was done engraving, I decided that I wanted to try and cut it out of the basswood, partly because I didn't square up the piece of wood to the image, so it was crooked. But really, I wanted to see if the laser was going to be capable of cutting through the 2.5 millimeter thick basswood that I had. So I set the laser power to 100% and started framing the image. And near the end of the sixth pass, <laughs> you'll see that I had a problem. Once the laser had gotten through the basswood, the inner part of the piece of wood lifted up, the laser caught it <laughs> and dragged the whole thing down. And then when it was time for the laser to go back left, it ended up cutting straight through the image a little bit. So in the future, I'll have to make sure that I raise the laser up just a little bit so it's got a little more clearance and maybe also tape the material down so if the laser housing does brush against it, it won't tend to try and move it. So here's a look at a few of the basswood samples that I engraved. This of course is the beach scene that we looked at in the last clip. Now you can see this one's engraved a little bit too heavy. I think I set the laser to 40% on this and probably should have dialed it back a little bit. And also here's that line that ended up getting engraved down the middle of it when the, the part moved after I was trying to cut it out. 
Next, I used one of the sample pieces of basswood that came with the kit, and I just engraved this logo. Now, you probably can't see it in the camera, but this is a little bit deep, and there's a little bit of charring around the lettering up here, so I think this one, I could have dialed the power back on that a little bit too, but overall, it came out pretty good. Now, the last one over here is the one that came out the best. This one's actually a little bit light. I probably could have went a little heavier on the power, or maybe taken a second pass at a lower power, but for the most part, this one came out pretty good. It's going to take me a little while and some trial and error to learn the, the best settings for the different materials, but I think I'm on the right track now. So I know this machine isn't capable of engraving into bare metal, but I wanted to try it on a painted, or in this case, powder coated surface. So I grabbed an old ham radio I had and decided to start engraving into the case. So on my first attempt, I decided to do the 741 logo in vector format. I set the laser to 100% power, and then had it do four passes. And as you can see here, the resultant image is there, but it's hard to see because it's just one laser width, so not extremely visible. So then I decided to move over to a different part of the case and I did a filled in version of the logo as if I were gonna engrave a piece of wood. And again, I had the laser set to 100% power and took four passes at the image, and this is what it looks like. This is my first experience with laser engraving, so I still have a lot to learn and things to try with this machine, but so far I'm pretty impressed. Now, if you're interested in purchasing one of these machines, a discount may be available depending on when you watch this video. So make sure you check the link in the description below to see if the discount is available. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.